Hello, welcome to Waypoint Survival. Today I'm uploading an interview that I did a few months ago with Pilgrim Radio. A couple of great guys, some really interesting information that I think you'll enjoy, and I'll make sure and put a link to their channel in the description box below. Ladies and gentlemen, how are you doing? It's good to see you guys. Keith, Grandma Prepper, Hutch, my brother, Reaper 10 millimeter, Stuart, JH556, and as everybody else enters, we'll say hello to you guys too. We've probably got one of the uh, the biggest guests ever in the history of the show uh, at this point. James Bender of Waypoint Survival. Good to see you, sir. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. It's yeah. good to be here. End right. of the foxhole. <laughs> my co-host. Yeah, man. So we reached out to James at Waypoint Survival, and uh, he responds to his comments on his videos. And he was gracious enough to accept this invitation to come on. So uh, I want to say thanks for coming. Thanks for letting us have you. Yeah, it's great to be on. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're thinking we'd talk for a little bit, and maybe when things kind of get wrapped up or slow down, we can invite a few people onto the channel to say, hey, um, we'll kind of do an open format. But uh, we'll, we'll hold off on that for a bit so we can have a conversation together. Um, um, do you do you want to uh, introduce yourself and tell people who you are if they don't know uh, what you do? Sure. Yeah, I'm James Bender, of course, Waypoint Survival. You can see that up there. But uh, I started the channel uh, about four years ago. I'm in my fifth year, and uh, I grew up in Tennessee. And back in the 70s, when uh, things were a lot different than they are today, and on into the 80s, and then uh, just have always been an outdoorsman, have always loved history. And I grew up Daniel Boone stories and not far from actually where Davy Crockett homesteaded uh, in the early 1800s. And then also, um, you know, later on Lewis Wetzel and as I got a little bit older, Simon Kenton. So definitely, uh, you know, love history and uh, spent a lot of time in the woods. Uh, back then we didn't call it uh, you know, being a, a survivalist or bushcrafting or any of that kind of stuff. It was just, you know, we would go on an adventure. That's what we called it. And we'd, we'd go miles. We didn't have cell phones. And uh, me and my younger brother and our cousin, they were, me and my brother and my cousin were, were about, uh, they were like eight or nine months apart. And I was several years old, about four and a half years older than them. And so I was the leader of, the, of all the expeditions. And we'd go for miles, cross country, through the woods, streams, creeks, uh, our parents had no idea where we were and, uh, we went with almost no gear. <laughs> of course, looking back and knowing more of what I know now and, uh, as, you know, as, as an adult and training people, uh, you know, we, we should have had something. Uh, we actually ended up getting turned around one time and that's a whole story in all of itself. But, uh, yeah, so kind of my background. And then as I got older, uh, I got into my late twenties after college, uh, I did the whole stint at school and after I graduated, got married and life settled down for me. And about three years after I got married, I, uh, three or four years, five, something like that. It was in that, that period of time where things settled down enough and we had our first child and I was really ready to get back into the woods. And so about 20 years ago, I, I started just, you know, dusting off my skills and heading back into the back country. And so that, that's sort of how I got into this. And after about 15 years of doing it, I decided that it was time to give back. And I actually wanted to start a school in 20, like 2009, 2010, something like that. And the timing just wasn't right. And the place we lived, we didn't have good property. And after that, we moved out into the middle of nowhere. And so I live almost a mile and a half off the pavement, which is great until you have to take your mail, your uh, garbage uh, out. And uh, that's also where my mailbox is. So yeah, it's actually, it's a, uh, it's an almost a three mile round trip just to walk to the mailbox and back. Yeah. I used to live in a place like that and uh, we had a little vegetable basket we put out by the mailboxes with a tin can people could put money in. And uh, mm. we, we made a lot of money off of honest people, you know, no one ripped us off. <laughs> it seems like when your mailboxes are that far out and grouped together, people know mm -hmm. they're in it together. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, not only do you have a channel, but you're starting to do a school of some kind. Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, so four years ago, the same time I started the channel in the spring, actually, and I started a, a blog in the spring, started the channel in July, and also started doing classes in about April of 2017. And I just, I've been taking in and taking in for a long time. Uh, I had done a little training under Dave Canterbury uh, with Pathfinder School. And oh, yeah. he actually lives, his school is actually not really very far from me. He only lives about an hour and a half away. Okay. But, uh, and I've, I've known Dave since 2008 or nine, something like that. And uh, good friends with uh, some of his lead instructors and just got a lot of connections in the bushcraft world. But anyway, I'd taken in for a long time and I love to teach. And I've had some, you know, professional formal training in teaching adults and various other things. So I thought, hey, it's time to go ahead and put this stuff into use. So I wrote a curriculum and I teach classes at our property here in southern Ohio, uh, four different phases. Uh, phase one, which is survival and bushcraft. Phase two is advanced survival and bushcraft. Phase three is pioneer survival and bushcraft. And phase four is primitive survival and bushcraft. And uh, I just actually wrapped up a primitive class about three weeks ago. Uh, we lived in a bark shelter that I built. It's a dome shape covered with uh, tulip poplar bark that I harvested. It took about a week and a half to build. And uh, it's the 12 feet in diameter. It's got a fire pit in the center with a smoke uh, yeah. hole at the top with a flap. And, uh, yeah, so we make stone knives. And we, we start at phase one, go all through phase four. And it's all about, uh, you know, learning how to go from modern to primitive if you would get in that situation so you're kind of rewinding time and building a more ancient set of skills right so you start off with a certain amount of gear and we learn those skills and then as you get better you get to the next phase we take away more tools and yeah. you focus more on skills and then actually the pioneer class is a little too heavy uh because again we're, we're talking about building log cabins and riving out shingles and you know what it would actually take to permanently live off grid if you have to yeah, so you're splitting your own shakers and everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, man. Uh, so I guess a couple questions come up. Like, um, are you just doing adults or you got teenagers and young kids? Yeah, so phase one, kids as young as eight can take it as long as they're accompanied by an adult or a legal guardian. And, of course, I have forms and things to fill out to make it all legal and safe and all that insurance-wise. But... Um, when you get up to phase two, you need to be at least 13 because it gets a lot more intense. And I don't want uh, kids to be discouraged. I think this is so important that it's a fun experience and that they learn. And my my classes are designed to so you can learn and pass. I don't try to fail people. I don't trick people. Uh, they want them to succeed. Pushing. Absolutely. That way yeah, they get confidence and want to do it again. Most definitely. Most definitely. Yeah. Now, one of the things I was thinking is, like, how many people sign up for stage one and actually follow through with the advanced stages? Do you get a lot of retention through the different classes? It falls off a lot after phase yeah. one. Yeah. I mean, you, you get lots and lots of people take phase one. And then uh, so far, uh, you know, you, you'll you get, uh, I, I would say, 10 to 15 percent of people go on to phase two. So and, but usually when they hit phase two, they want to go on through. Oh, okay. So that's like the breaking point. Yeah. Yes. And it's probably a more personal class then when you get up in the higher levels because there's less people to draw from. Probably more Absolutely. long, long time. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, just, just like our, our this last primitive class that we had, there was only four of us, including myself. And so all four of us slept in a bark shelter. We were like a little tribe. Yeah. So it was really cool. Now, how can people find this class? Uh, yeah, uh, www.waypointsurvival.com. And you can yes. find all the information you need there, including my contact information. Do you hear that, mods? Sh share that out. Yeah, so we got some people in the chat that are going to put that in the comments or what? Yeah, that's at the moderators. They'll, they'll do all that. They'll, they'll cool. share. They can share all the links. Yeah. It's good to have a website as a backup, though, compared to YouTube or anything like that, I believe, as well. That's something I've been thinking about is trying to get into websites. You got yeah, some... Websites uh, Websites very important. Okay. Now, what, what else was you asking them, Foxhole? Well, I'm just interested. The classes sound like a lot of fun. You know? Are they are they grueling, though, to people? Or, uh, once you get no. to a higher level, okay, so there's not, like, too strenuous? No. 
Um, because, you know, the, the point of it is that a lot of these are skills based and it's, it's not about, you know, can you run 10 miles with a rucksack on your back? I mean, this is not military training. Uh, I'm not military trained. I'm a backwoodsman. And so, uh, you know, obviously if, if some sort of event would happen, you know, being in shape is up to that person's, you know, up to their health level and also their age. And there's a lot of factors that play into whether or not a person, you know, is able to get out there and, and go a long distance with a heavy pack, but you should still be able to have the skills to, uh, you know, to make do. So, you know, the, the most strenuous part of our courses, uh, sometimes the fire starting stuff can be a little, uh, a little strenuous, just especially in the summer, you get high temperatures and you're, you know, you're yeah. trying to process firewood and all that kind of stuff, uh, especially on the timed, uh, competitions those are always fun but the compass courses uh, that we do uh, they're not you, you probably will not go more than a mile mile and a half in a whole compass course but they are definitely through some rugged terrain so that's probably the most strenuous it gets when you were saying earlier when we were having a quick chat that these aren't like like advanced like well, excuse me these aren't sophisticated skills. These are sort of basic knowledge that people should have, you know. Well, phase one about. is for sure. Yeah, it you gets know, it gets much more to... specialized and intense as it goes up to phase two. You're saying okay. people just need to be prepared for life. And you were saying that there were some kids that had never even worked with fire before. Yeah. Not so even I was a matchstick, you said. Oh, my bad. Yeah. No, no, no you're fine. Uh, I was at a youth camp. Uh, I spoke uh, four different times at a youth camp uh, earlier this year, back in July, and I was shocked at the number of kids. I asked them how many of you have ever struck a match or lit a match in your life, and there were hands all over the audience, uh, the kids, and I was just shocked because these were you know, some of them were teenagers, and I know we don't want little kids playing with fire, but uh, it was it was such a shocking thing to me because growing up in the country, back country of Tennessee, we had a wood stove. We were always burning brush. And, you know, even, even though my dad didn't let me play with fire, you know, obviously, because I had a good dad. But I was still around. I was taught the proper way to use things and, and demonstrated it to me, right? These kids have never even struck a match. So, yeah, when, most, when people don't even, most people don't even know how to strike a match. There's actually a proper way to do it. Huh. Well, you're going to have to make a video of that. <laughs> you know, when you're in a safe situation, you're following safety rules and you have supervision, I think it's good to let kids explore that kind of thing so that mm -hmm. they're not doing it out of curiosity when you're not watching because that's when they're going to get yeah. in trouble. Yeah. You know, it's the and same and that's, that's what we do. I mean, that's one of the things you, I tell people about our phase one class, you'll start more fires in one day in different ways than you ever have in your life. See, I think that's good because, uh, like, what do you think causes people, this is kind of, this is causes people to maybe, what do you think would cause a kid to not want to get into um, bushcraft and survival living? Like, I've always been into, you know, camping and hunting and fishing my entire life, but I know some people who I grew up with, they can't, they, they're, that's just not their thing, even though they had the same teaching and stuff too. Do you, is there anything you think that, uh. Because I'm thinking about getting my son in Tennessee now. You can get a, a lifetime hunting and fishing license for 200 bucks if they're below the age of two. So that's I think that's a, that's a pretty good Christmas gift for the boy for sure. And but what do you think? There's anything that people should like stay away from that would maybe cause the kids to not be interested anymore in it. Well, I think that what a lot of people make mistakes, um, especially with their kids when they're young, like if mom and dad enjoy camping or hiking or backpacking or, you know, anything, of course, you can get all the way to pretty extreme stuff. But what happens is, is the kids have a miserable experience. And so what you have to do the first time you take them out is you you have to carry all the weight. If they carry anything, it's a super light backpack. Uh, you stop when they're tired. You don't just push on, you know, you really pay attention to kind of the lowest common denominator of the group. And you, you just make absolutely sure that they have a phenomenal time. Take some bug spray. Make sure they don't get eaten alive by mosquitoes. You know, don't tease them with snakes and frogs. And you know what I'm saying? It's like all of that stuff that when kids have a negative experience, they just never want to go back because it, it was just yeah. such a horrendous thing. They'd rather stay in the house and play video games. So, and yet the outdoors can be awesome. So exactly. And that's what I'm scared. These are video games. Um, but we have a, can groups reserve uh, families or corporate, as an example, Roman Prepper asked for the uh, classes? 
Yes. Yeah, I like to have for reservations at least uh, 10 students if I can. Okay. And the classes yeah, are very affordable. Be... Yeah, how much are they? So it's $125 for a phase one class for an adult, and students are always $50 all the way up through college. And how long does the class run for? Phase one is a 48-hour class. Starts on uh, Thursdays at 3 o'clock and runs through Saturday about 3 or 4 o'clock. Yeah, so. you're practically giving it away yeah. at that price. Yeah, you're getting that knowledge for price. a damn price. Yeah, I'll probably raise my prices at some point, but I just hate to because I really want to keep it affordable for families, and I think everybody ought to be able to train. So, I heard that. Yeah. yeah that would be... um. People with a working family can afford to do that. You know, they could save a little bit of money and then enroll everyone, including the kids, and then get away for a weekend. Yeah, yeah. that's real nice. Yeah, and actually I have it set up on my website so you can pay with PayPal. So if someone has oh. to use a credit card, it takes two or three months and, and knock that out too if they wanted. They could pay it ahead of time. And uh, yeah, so yeah. like I said, we're trying to be trying to be flexible. Yeah. Hmm. That's good. That's good. And, and do you get people traveling because they see your uh, your YouTube videos and they say, oh, Ohio is not that far away and they make like a five hour trip or. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I have eight, eight hours or as far as I've had people in the middle of Pennsylvania. And uh, wow. And of course, as the as the school grows and you get more and more people interested, you know, people do come from farther. So. Now, with your classes, there's got to be an element of like history that ties into it because your videos a lot of your videos are kind of reenactment or they're bringing them back the technology you know you got your hobo tin can stove and, yes uh, so there what course does that start to appear in like uh phase two or phase three yeah so we started getting into friction fire uh in phase two okay and so that's that's sort of getting back into your historical thing and then phase three like i said we get into the pioneer uh, survival and of course then you're 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 required to only start a fire with flint and steel you can't use anything else and we're not talking ferrocerium rod uh you kind of lose the ferrocerium rod after phase one uh we, we go deeper and deeper into primitive skills by the time you get to phase four you're using a hand drill to start your fires and so uh, we train you to do that so yeah we we go deeper back into history and uh you know the history of of how you get your food how you stay you know, cover life. Training. Yeah. you talk a lot about Yes, we do that in phase three. And I had, I was really privileged. I had Dan Lutz uh, with Abnormal Outdoors. Uh, he's got a really good YouTube channel. It's a small channel, uh, but he's growing. I think he's got a couple thousand subs. But yeah, so it's Dan Lutz with Abnormal Outdoors. And he is, uh, he's a 40 year plus veteran trapper. And he used to be a professional poacher. And so he came down and that was many years ago. He's quit living that, that mm. life, but I'm up and up now, but he knows how to get food. And so we had him at our phase three class. And I mean, it was just, oh, wow. it's one of those jaw dropping things where you just, everything that he says, he doesn't even realize he has that much knowledge because it's become so much a part of him. I mean, he used to, he used to trap uh, skin and process a thousand animals a year. So oh, wow. that's a lot yeah. of work. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. They have family to feed. So. Is the man that you did the video and y'all was hunting for, uh, y'all hunting for beaver in that one? It was like a 22 minute one. That yeah, was a good yeah, one. Back I saw in January that one today. This year. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a character. He's six foot eight. <laughs> oh my God. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. He's, um, but yeah, I mean, he's, go ahead. I'm trying to get them to share the link to him real quick in the, so which came first, the, the interest in the classes or the interest in making videos? Well, I'll be honest. I, I actually started making videos so I could get people to come to the classes. Okay, yeah, like a little sneak peek, basically. Well, you know, when you when you want to train people but nobody knows who you are, they don't know your skill level, you got to shingle and say, hey, you know, I'm a survival teacher. I'm a you know, quote unquote expert. And I, I hate to use that word because, you know, really, uh, that, that, that's, that's hard to define what an expert is, but, uh, you know, the, the bottom line of survival is, is you, you just don't die. So, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that, far, that can, that can go experts. through. 
Right, and that could go on. There's a lot of there's a lot of levels of agony. One of the things I like to I like to think about is called the caveman index. And it was a guy that wrote about it a few years ago. And he said that basically when you look at history, you know, he what he calls the caveman index is how far down do you want to be? Do, do you want to be the guy that's, you know, eating food that something else killed and dragging it back into the cave raw? You know, or do you want to be the guy that's building shelters and starting fires? Uh, you know, at, at which level will you be if something happens and society goes the wrong direction and you're really on your own? Uh, at what skill level would you be and where would you fall in the caveman index? So it's kind of a kind of a fun exercise. You know, could you really rebuild civilization with your own hands? At least they your family comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, I've been watching a lot of shelter building videos and guys go all out and build a little mini log cabin and cover it with mud. Mm -hmm. and, but that's, you know, living in comfort, really. Yes, I guess it, it is. Depends yes, on it your, is. I guess it depends on your purpose, too, if you're on the move or if you're looking to shelter in place, you know. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I think is kind of interesting is there's this line between uh, prepping and survival and homesteading. And, you know, I've met Pilgrim on a uh, chat channel called Telegram, where we're kind of talking to each other about our videos. And a lot of those folks on Telegram are into prepping and they're serious about it. And me, I feel like I'm a little bit more of a homesteader. Like I got chickens in a garden, but I haven't really stockpiled, you know? Yeah, how would you rate mm -hmm. yourself in that sort of spectrum? Uh, and, and well, without, <laughs> if you're not comfortable talking about your preps, I mean, and, but where does that line also dissolve? You know, uh, when, when is it you're no longer a prepper and you're actually starting a homestead, you know? <laughs> well, I think it's a continuum. I think that, that when you first get started, you know, you put together, you know, a bucket of rice and beans and oatmeal, and then you think about a water filter. And then you think about how am I going to cook it? And then so you become like a, a prepper and you're living in town and you've got a few items on a shelf in your basement. And then as time goes on, you start looking at it and you ask yourself, what if this lasted longer than a week? You know, what if it was more than a power or winter storm or, you know, a hurricane, tornado, depending where you live. And, and this lasted a month. And so then you start thinking more and more about, you know, what would I have to do? Uh, to go deeper into this. And so I think that's where you start. It, you know, it, it's it's not just about piling up boxes of freeze-dried meals or, um, you know, trying to, um, I don't know what, what the word is there, but, you know, the people that you can get a, a basement full of stuff, put it that way. But that runs out. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a limited supply. If you have 10 tubes of toothpaste and every time you brush your teeth, you have just that much less. And eventually you'll hit the last one and you'll squeeze the last bit out. And so what you have to do then, you, you, as, as you like I said, you're on this continuum, you get to the point that you're going, what can I use instead of toothpaste? And so then you get into baking soda and then you get into grinding up charcoal from your fire. And then you think, well, what if I lose my toothbrush? And then, you go, oh, I can take a willow twig and I can chew it and fray the end of it. And I can use that to brush my teeth a little bit. So it kind of translates. Like I said, the, the, the more you get into this and the farther you go, depending on your mindset, you actually end up, I think, if you follow it logically, you end up getting into survival training. Right. It's like how to renew what you have. I, I think right. anything, anything over a year or so, you know, you can make it through a winter on some supplies, but then you got to be ready for the next winter, you know, because the stores aren't going to open back up. It's going to be a bad winter right, this think, year, too, man. I, I agree. I agree. And I think, you know, I think that self-sufficiency, more than prepping, I think is where we logically need to end up as far as looking at the future. Because unless you're, you know, inordinately wealthy, you're going to end up with running out of your supplies at some point, no matter how much you've been able to put back. And so the idea of having a place to grow your own food, um, having e even if it's just some container uh, gardening on a back deck is very important uh, because that little bit can sometimes mean the difference. I mean, during World War II, they had victory gardens and they found that they could grow 50 pounds of potatoes on a, a, the back porch 
which of a of a, an apartment in the city, even if it's ten stories up, uh, they could grow in a stack of old tires. They could grow fifty pounds of potatoes. So yeah, stuff like self sufficiency. That. That's a good word for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's so lost on uh, a lot of people and. Uh, for a lot of people in my generation and like the generation below me, I get, I think they're called uh, the Y generation or something. Like, why do I got to do this? Why do I got to do that? You know, but <laughs> they're like, I, I feel like we're just, our self sustainability skills are almost, because I went to the Boy Scouts, but whenever I was in the Boy Scouts, we were making like pine cone uh, deer and stuff. And, we were making race cars and stuff like that. We weren't making fires. We weren't practicing with bows and stuff. I can only imagine what they're doing in the Boy Scouts now. I don't think they're doing anything like that now in the Boy Scouts. They're probably, but I, I just feel like what, um, I kind of got lost there for a second. I apologize. But the, uh, with the whole, I just feel like this, this generation and the one below us, they have, a. Uh, I don't know if it's like on purpose for there to be no survival skills. Like, I don't know, man. It just, we just, uh, we just have it so easy, you know? Exactly. I think that's exactly what it is. We in the West and not just in America, you know, but in England and stuff, Canada, you know, they have it pretty easy too. They have it. We, we have it easy. And so do they, but they, uh, that's what I, I think happened too easy though, but <laughs> there's but a, so many people, in my generation have no knowledge. There's a, a psychological phenomena called normalcy bias. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or not, but normalcy bias is where you are biased toward the normal. Uh, things have always been good. There's always been always been gas in the pumps. There's always been, you know, um, food at the store. And why why be a prepared person? Why know how to start a fire? I just go to the thermostat and I flick a switch or I can control it, you know, from my, from my smartphone. And I mean, I, there's a lot of people do that. And I mean, they got surveillance all over their house and they, they feel, you know, technology and, and in the just, just in time transportation system uh, developed by the Japanese back in the eighties has made everybody feel, you know, very comfortable that it's always going to be this way. So that's normalcy bias. And then out of the, out of nowhere comes what's called a black swan event. And the reason it's caused that is we call that is because back several hundred years ago, everybody just knew that all swans were white. I mean, it was a given. And then they found a flock of black swans and it just shocked everybody. It shocked the scientific world because it wasn't supposed to be possible. So anyway, that's what's called a black swan event. It's something that is so unexpected that it takes everybody by surprise. So, Well, I think that's what we're going through right now is people are realizing that there isn't this comfort safety net. I mean, we, we all rode the storm this last two years, pretty good, but we saw some basic commodities disappear. And we realized that uh, we had to brush up on our hygiene and no matter how much macaroni you had in the cupboard, it caught you off a of guard. You know, I didn't have uh, enough toilet paper, enough beans. And I think that a lot of people are going towards these videos now, starting to think, I need to learn to make fire. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are yeah. building bug out well, you bags. Know, and yeah. And the whole toilet paper thing is really hilarious because, you know, a, a good wash rag and uh, a bucket <laughs> of like 10, 15 percent bleach with water in it. Yeah. And you just you just wipe yourself and then you drop the drop it in the bucket and use a toilet plunger and you plunge it, agitate it to wash it out, and then you rinse it in clean water. So you have a stack of clean washcloths on one side, and you have a bucket on the other. You keep the lid just sitting on top of it, and as soon as you clean yourself up, you drop the dirty one in there. When you get five or ten in a bucket, you agitate them, rinse them out, take them out, put them in the line, dry them in the, in the sunlight where the ultraviolet can kill the bacteria, and then you bring it back in the house and stack them up to be used again. Yeah, see, it's, it's, it's simple, you know, the way you describe it, but it's like a stretch. You have to really reach to ask yourself, how do I do this? You know, because mm -hmm. those commodities have been so close at hand. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can even just keep a pail of water uh, by your toilet and just yes. splash water on yourself. Just wash yourself off like a like a hand hand handmade bidet. <laughs> but you pour uh, it down as small your back is what you do. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, that's why in, in some countries you never touch people's uh, left hand, that's literally. Right. So. Mm-hmm. I've heard the same thing. So little Urban Prepper signed on. Is he, uh, is he muted? He's a, he's a, he's a, he really, uh, he messes with, he, he watches your oh, stuff. I'm hard. here, guys. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Good with me. Let, let me give you a little background real I quick. I don't know what's the issue with, yeah. Yeah, man, I'm still having internet issues, like the local issues. You have internet issues still over there? And the <laughs> background is not uploading right now. Maybe, maybe if you reboot, you'll be good to go. Yeah. So James, the, the little urban prepper, he kind of pulled this community together. He's the one that started the Telegram channel. And okay. it's funny because I had a few videos and he had comment religiously, give me the thumbs up. Um, and uh, I'd get back to him and I said, let's, let's connect and do something like together. And so he built that Telegram channel. We found Pilgrim or Pilgrim found us, and uh, it's kind of neat. It'd be nice to get more people like-minded together and have these mm-hmm. discussions. You see, uh, another interesting thing about Lord Recover, though, he's a, he's in India. You guys, oh, right, you know, yeah. styles kind of remind me of each other a little bit as far as the DIY of, you know, something like, oh, I, this glasses case, I can make this into all kind, or this Altoids tin, like, <laughs> like he's he's a, he he's a, like a very much a MacGyver kind of person himself as well. Like his, his DIYs. What got you interested in tinkering like that, though? That's something else. I that, that was on my list. I forgot to ask you. <laughs> I've always built stuff since I was a kid. I was a I was huge into Lego, and always invented and built stuff. Uh, was always out messing around in the garage. I actually make custom knives, uh, and uh, so I don't make many of them anymore. I'm too busy. But I take uh, every once in a while, I'll make a few a year and uh, sell them. But but I, yeah, I used to just always make stuff. I made bows and arrows when I was a kid. I mean, we used to mess around with, uh, you know, any anything that I could grind and, and put a point and an edge on, you know. And <laughs> we were surrounded by thickets and uh, blackberry bushes and all, all that kind of stuff. And you'd go chop vines down and you know, we, we made trails and built shelters and Probably the, the most most fun shelter, most durable shelter I built was my folks had got uh, a stack of old tin from a building that got, and I took and I, I took a hammer and I bent it in half like this in an A-frame and then took the bottom where it was and, and, and folded those out this way. So it sat down and it was flat. And then I took the ribs because it was it was called the old 5V. It had five uh, V shapes across the top, one in the center and two on the sides. And I put those over top to make it waterproof. I had three stacked up, so I had a, I had a metal tent, and uh, that was that was probably the most durable shelter that I built. You guys must have disappeared. You must have disappeared in that thing like two nights every week, you know, or all summer long. <laughs> yeah, it was funny back then because you know, like I said, we didn't have cell phones, and, and we were far enough away that. Uh, folks couldn't holler and so you know it was just like be home by dark or be home by supper time and we would just be gone so yeah we would yeah. run around yeah i got my first tent i got my first action i got my first actual one i line got my first backpack when i was four <laughs> so you're kind of so. like you're you're meant to be an outdoors <laughs> kind of no yeah i tried to run away from home once with my backpack that, that, that was uh i my, my mom had disciplined me and i was not happy <laughs> yeah yes yeah, so well we actually i, I, I <laughs> well i was actually i was like yeah i was actually born in florida and uh, we lived down there in, until the late 70s and what was funny is i i took my little backpack and my stuff and i put a little water in my canteen and I went to my grandma's house because she lived on the same property we did just down a ways. And I went to my grandma's house and had her make me, uh, I think, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And she would cut out the shape of a gingerbread man. She had one of those tin cookie cutters. It was like a gingerbread man. She, she cut that out and put that in a, in a baggie for me. And so I went and stood out by the fence on our road with my thumb out uh, to hit. Hike and, and <laughs> I, was, I probably should go back home. But yeah, that's what I did with my first backpack. Tried to hit the road. Really hitchhiking. <laughs> right. Yeah, like I said, I was yeah. probably four, four or five, something like that. 
Yeah, if you're taking a gingerbread man uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you're not quite meant to get that far from the house. Well, you know, I mean, that whole thing of catch me if you can, you know, uh, the gingerbread man. I don't know, there might have been something to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, one thing that I, I really like about your channel is, um, you know, you're doing some kind of like historical stuff where, you know, you're showing us a hobo kitchen. It's pretty simple, but you also restore the, the virtue and reputation of the hobo, you know, that they're a working man. And then you also have right. other videos where you're, you're taking people back in time where you're making these historical references yeah, that 1790s series man i'd binge watched that thing this uh past two days dude it's like a short Thank movie you. in a way but it's also like crossed with the history channel he still yeah. ain't got to ohio yet you still ain't got to ohio yet in that series i'm still i'm like when's he gonna get he's still in kentucky he's still <laughs> yes that's right and uh yeah i've actually been working on filming episode nine it just takes me several weeks to get it together because i'm working all by I myself that. i do you know all the camera work i have to write the script i have to you know make the connections and drive places and i mean that that last episode eight uh i drove both to indiana and kentucky it was like three three and a half hours one way well, that's dedication uh, right that there video. So, yeah, there's a lot of work goes into it, but, you know, to me, it's important to try to keep it as pure as I can uh, with the limited funds I have as it's self-funded. But, uh, wow. yeah, and I, I also have an 1880s camping series. Uh, there's four episodes of that. So I don't okay. know if you've seen any of those or not, but that was that was a lot of fun. I, did that I was uh, just about to start uh, watching that one today, but then I had to go get my son. And so I'll be binge watching that one, though, next for sure. How far yeah, there's no talking in that one. Grade? Really? I oh, so you have to be paying attention to yeah. it really good. That way you'll be able to see each thing that you're doing in it. Okay. Yeah, it's just it's just music and me just doing stuff. So yeah, it's it's it was interesting. It's just something different, and it's all it's all in like a sepia tone, so it gives it that old fashioned sort of feel. What's up? So, Roman Prepper, my brother. What's up, man? Can y'all hear me? Yeah, we can yes. hear you. My headset was doing hinky stuff earlier today. But Lure and Prepper signal got lost. Um, hit hit because they're they're still being affected. I I guess whatever happened to to Facebook today is affecting like some of those like countries in that area's internet. You know, not just like their Facebook. Like, but the Facebook servers were over in India. That would be interesting. And no, not that, but like they're um like all the internet's messed up over there. Mm -hmm. Roman Prepper, are you familiar with the uh, James here? No, I haven't. Uh, I, up until you had him on here, I'd never heard of Waypoint or anything. James, it's good to meet you. Yes, yeah, he, well. yeah, this he's very. This man is very prolific. He, he's he's about that. Uh, he's about the DIY system, and he's also very historical minded as well. How many videos do you have, James? Uh, two hundred and thirty-two, I think, include the one I just loaded tonight. So. Oh, Tonight yeah. I made a, uh, a busy man there. Yeah, uh, yeah. I do one a week, so sometimes two, but mostly how, one. Go ahead. How long have you been on YouTube for, James? Uh, since July twelfth of twenty seventeen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you got to check out the channel. It's uh, it's a lot okay. of fun to watch. Now, now you have fifty eight point one oh one. Oh, wow. subscribers. <laughs> yeah yeah i'll be glad when i finally get to that hundred mark and get that uh, little silver play button that plaque they send you that's always kind of cool but it's taking me a long time to get here so i'm appreciative like for every subscriber describing about the uh the way the classes are structured because that's something i've seen or i've heard from people that oh i took this course but um, they were like doing some kind of recon ruck march and we just wanted to learn how not to die in the woods, you know, some. Right. Yeah, I, I find that's a problem, especially if you take courses from people that are military trained. Uh, I think that there's yeah. a certain amount of nostalgia for boot camp <laughs> and they think that everybody needs to kind of go through a sort of a boot camp to be certified. And the truth of it is, you know, if you got somebody that's the oldest person that took me five years old and uh and of course i've had kids as young as eight in the past uh with the help of an adult you know obviously right. but it's 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 designed to teach you 
how to do things. And I, I, I want to be there hands on to show you why it's not working and help you figure out how to make it work so that, you know, by the time you're done, you actually walk away with a real skill and not just, you know, you saw somebody else do it. So, you know, it's funny you say that because I was one of the leaders from my son's Cub Scout group and I was a scout. For you guys, give me one second. I'm sorry. And the dads were the ones I had to watch. It wasn't mm. the little boys. The little boys, I'd tell them, you know, do this. And there were dads almost caught their tents on fire. I'm like, guys, no. <laughs> I, I, I told the coordinator, I said, we should take all the parents out first and, and make sure they don't do anything yeah. detrimental. Right. You, know, you, you have yeah. the little eight-year-old cubby telling dad that's not how you hold a knife that's yeah and i'm i'm not against the military i love the military i mean i've got family that served and we've got family all the way back to the revolutionary war so you know i mean i'm i'm very much about that and i've had several guys that have come to my course uh that have been in various branches and the difference in what I teach and what the military teaches is that we're, you know, we're into self-reliance. You don't have a line of supply. There's no chain of command. Uh, there's nobody to fall back on. You can't call for air support. You can't call for any support. You're on your own. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that makes you're, a you're addressing of a different audience. And, and you've done the right thing from a business perspective is you're addressing your target demographic, which is families and, you know, individuals, not, you know. No, you, you, that's a smart play for a business. Absolutely. Well, it's working so far. And, uh, like I said, I've, I've <laughs> really good. enjoyed meeting, really enjoyed meeting the people that have come out to train and, and, uh, I've got another class here in a couple of weeks. And so I'm really looking forward to, uh, it's up in central Ohio, Ohio, is it not? It's Southern Ohio. Yeah. Southern Ohio. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, sadly from my pretty much any of the places I've lived in Texas, that's an 18 hour drive. So. Right. <laughs> it, may, it may be a next year trip for me. Be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we, we have, you know, we're rural, but we have a town not terribly far from us. And so if a person wanted to come and stay, you know, a little bit longer outside of the class, you know, the night before, the night after in a nice motel, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's available too, so. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your property and uh, your, your little homestead? Like how much land you got? And, uh, yeah, so we, we personally we personally have seventeen and a half acres, but we're surrounded by uh, oh, wow. another hundred and six acres, uh, and we have a very large creek that flows through. We have about six hundred and sixty feet of creek frontage. It's about forty feet wide where it hits our property. And there's bass, you know. I've caught twenty inch bass in there. Uh, there's all kinds of fish, you know, sunfish, bluegill, you know, the typical panfish, and. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've got a lot of hardwoods, uh, sear, uh, but oak and hickory and walnut, a lot of black walnut. Um, there, there's all kinds of stuff around here, too. Uh, of course, most of our ashes died from the ash, wood ash borer, and uh, that's kind of infested our area. But uh, we, we, have, we have a really nice property and uh, really, really good areas to train in. How high up are you? The altitude. I'm sitting. Yeah, yeah we're about 800 feet above sea level. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's really easy for anyone who's coming to visit. Yeah, 840, 850, something like that. Uh, but we're we are in uh, the foothills of the Appalachians. We're right in that area, so uh, the terrain where we live is very, very hilly, very rugged. Okay. So it makes it makes for really interesting training uh, courses. Yeah, yeah, you can do a little bit of shelter and hiding, camouflage. Yeah, it lends itself to we've got we've got fields and uh, you know fields and forests. So we've got we've got the and the and the big big stream which when it floods is practically a river. So there's you know a having that much water is just a blessing. That must be really nice to go on down there. And uh, you have kids, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're blessed with it. Five, yes. Five kids. Yeah, five kids. Four Man, they must, they must run them up. My, my two, there, huh? Well, my, my, my two oldest are married, and so I'm expecting a first grandchild in January. Okay, so, congratulations on that. Yeah, thanks. But, uh, yeah, so we still have three at home, but they're good kids. So we, we've raised them right, so they don't really cause us much trouble. So we, we enjoy having them around. 
Yeah. And my my 15-year-old, uh, phase one and two, and my one uh, nine-year-old daughter has taken phase one. And so my youngest, she's seven, and she's wanting to take phase one probably next year. She's a little young right now, but she'll be eight coming up. So, And, you know, I'd encourage the audience to go check out the website that we posted earlier because uh, even if you've taken this kind of training before, you know, you haven't done it in 10 years, chances are there are little things you forget, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, even, you know, shooting any kind of skill, it can be diminished just over time uh, yeah. unless yeah. you have that critique. That well, and, no matter, training. and no matter how good you get at something, mm -hmm. uh, you can always use more practice. Oh, yeah. uh, I was, I started a fire today so I could have a nice bed of coals for my video and I put it out accidentally. <laughs> I had a, I had a, and I start, I start so many fires throughout the year. I mean, I, I do that all the time and I just did something really stupid. Uh, I, I, what I, I had the fire going and it was burning well and I, I put some larger sticks on it and I knocked it apart. I knew immediately what I had done as soon as I, I cause I, I hit it with a, a larger stick. I was trying to put it on there. And when I did that, I knocked that tiny tinder bundle that was on fire. I knocked it apart. And yeah. I just, I just instantly, I tried to save it and I'm like, you know what? It's, it's, it's done. And it just was an instant reminder to me, like, no matter how good you are, uh, if you don't mm -hmm. continually stay in practice. Um, and, and of course, you know, if you're in a situation where that was your last match, oh, <laughs> man. you know, so yeah, it, you have to continually stay on top of it. Well, and you yeah. put that, you put an element of stress in the equation too, where like depression's mm -hmm. kicking in or anxiety yes. because of situations, mm -hmm. your skill sets are just going to immediately drop yeah. a little. Well, that's, yeah, 50%. That's, that's what they say. So if your, your, your fine motor skills drop by 50, drop by half uh, when you get under yeah. stress. Yeah, exactly. So, it's interesting. One of the things that the people always fail on in my classes is they fail in fire preparation. Uh, they don't they don't take enough time to prepare the various stages of building a fire, and so they don't get a strong enough fire to begin. And they try to pile firewood on it, and it goes out. So because a fire has to be built, and you, know, you you start. I tell my classes it's like working through the gears on a on a stick shift. You know, you, you start the engine, you get the little spark, you get that little fire, and then then you go into first gear, and and that's your little tiny twigs and you have that until it gets strong enough and then you can go into second gear but it's like i said if you've ever driven a stick shift it's that whole thing you can't start the engine and put it in in fifth gear and drive off it'll just kill the engine and uh, i've actually been in a, on a winter uh, survival camping trip and i saw guys they were, they were trying to light, light a log uh they actually had a can of a lighter fluid like zippo lighter fluid and squirting <laughs> it on the log and then they would light it and and it was just yeah it was miserable and so it's surprising what you see. Hmm. Yeah, and I guess the wetter it is and the colder it is, the more gears you got to kind of work through to get that fire to self-sustain. Yeah. Fire is hardest to start when you need it the most. Oh, yeah. And that goes back to the stress and, and you know, especially if people are inexperienced, the panic sets in. Yes. Uh, and that's when yeah. they start setting their hands on fire. I saw that's another one I saw with the Cub Scouts. Someone mm. using lighter fluid got mm -hmm. it on his hands, threw the match, lit his hand on fire, and we had to put him out. So, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. where you By get the your way, first aid uh, merit badge. <laughs> the kids keep, got their merit badge. Yeah, yeah. Keep your mustard handy. Get those, those yeah. little packets of mustard. Mm -hmm. You put those on a burn and then and then wrap it with some aluminum foil really? the aluminum foil draws the heat out and the mustard helps uh, helps it heal and takes the, the burn out and so yeah so those I little tiny packs that you get at the at the store yeah, grab you those some the, the ones that yeah, the teenagers step on and spray your car with yeah that's that's I kind work of at a, uh, <laughs> i work at kind of a, it's kind of like a fancy restaurant type deal but anytime you get any kind of burns there any kind of grease burns any kind of you know burns from cooking and stuff it, that's what we'll do we'll put that mustard on the burns and it'll, it'll get rid of the pain mm -hmm. almost instantly and uh, it won't make the uh, the wound as big either yeah yeah it's it's super handy yeah. like i said those little packs you can throw those in your first aid kit so yeah, the faster you can get the heat out of the flesh, the, the less damage it does. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I burn my, my hand, I'll, I'll spit on my hand. I'll spit on it and blow on it. Yeah. Make some again, you're trying to, to draw that heat out. Right. Okay. I don't do it really often. The, most of the time when I burn myself is I'm trying to melt paracord, you know, get the end of the strand. Oh, right. you get the little plastic thing on you. That hurts. Like <laughs> yeah. Paracord will burn your fingers like nothing else. Cause it sticks to your skin and it just is so hot. Yeah. Is so you learn how to do it eventually. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's the same principle. Yeah, I get burnt probably about two or three times a day. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, working. <laughs> right? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's definitely, it has its ups and downs, though. It's better than it used to be working at one for sure, but it's, uh, you still get burnt, you still get cut. Now, have you ever had any, uh, you ever had anybody just give up and like, oh, because yeah, I know, like you said, like it's easy and you, you do design to, to pass and stuff. But you ever, you yeah, ever had anybody that's like a couple of years ago, I had a, a, a young boy, eight or nine, 10 years old, something like that. He was with his dad. And uh, I don't know what the emotional state or what, you know, what was going on there. But we had a thunderstorm came, coming in and uh, he had been struggling a little bit with some of the tasks. His dad was helping him and uh, they almost left. Uh, that's the closest I've ever had, though. They actually went, walked back to the parking area and sat in the vehicle, turned the air conditioner on, cooled down a little bit because it was a summertime class. So it was like June or July. It was really hot. So a little bit of overheating, thunderstorm came in, lightning flashing and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, generally, I, just I, I, I needed I, a reset. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And after a little bit, he came back and they finished the class and I was really proud of him and told him so when I handed out their certificates. I mean, I think he was, he was beaming pretty broadly. He was pretty, pretty happy. So, Well, gentlemen, I'm going to have to skedaddle. I have an early wake up tomorrow, but it was a pleasure meeting you, James. And, and yes, you as well. Also, Pilgrim, thanks again. You guys, as safe. always, it was good talking to you, Roman Prepper. We'll talk to you again in the future, brother. Right. Chat. Y'all be good. Be safe. <laughs> Yeah, he's so cool. I'm, Roman is cool. He's helping moderate the group a little bit then. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. Hey, so I wanted to ask about, you know, the community of people around you. You said that you were with the Pathfinder and your school. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to get the Pathfinder. What was it? Say to me again. I apologize. I, my, I was messing with my uh, microphone. Ah. Uh, okay. One more time. One more time. Oh, I was, I was asking James, like, um, what other people in the community have you sort of banded together with? You got the guy who's doing trapping. Right. Yeah. Dan Lutz. People. Right. Yeah. Um, also, uh, I... Uh, do a little bit of stuff. I did actually, there's a, a video where I went up to Michigan with Jamie Burley, a uh, lead instructor with the uh, Pathfinder School. And he and I are pretty good friends. Actually, I'm going to be going up and we'll be seeing them at the Central Ohio uh, Bushcraft Gathering this coming Thursday. It starts Thursday and runs through the weekend. And okay. uh, so with him, uh, Jason Hunt, who runs the Campcraft Outdoors down in Kentucky, uh, has his own school. And, uh, yeah, and there's, there's just a, a bunch of other people that, that I communicate with now and then, uh, those are the people that I know personally, uh, that are fairly high profile in the bushcraft and survival world. Of course, Dave Canterbury, and I mentioned him, but legendary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we don't hang out. He's way up there, you know? So, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he was definitely somebody that I learned from in the early years and, uh, you know, I mean, everybody was learning from him, so he, he, he had a lot, of, lot to share. Yeah, it's good to give these people a little shout out, you know, so that the viewers know where to turn for like their their foundation of knowledge, you know. Because Voxel got me into David Canterbury, actually. Mm -hmm. Did I? Yeah, you did. You told me about him a couple months ago, whenever he and I. Because I was talking about uh, Greg Ovens, is somebody uh, great. You know, he's oh, yeah. in uh, Canada, yeah. And then we started talking. And then we start talking about you, James, and then boom, we're talking to you. And it's like, ah, <laughs> you know who I'd like to have on is, um, the camping guy, Steve, he camps behind buildings and in thickets at rest stops. Um, he does all the, uh, stealth camping. Stealth that camping reminds man. me 
the sycamore tree whenever you uh and that was one of my favorite parts of that 1790s series oh, was whenever you the okay. those hollow sycamore trees man because i'm in yes. listen talking about um davy crock and all that my son every time he listens to uh that davy crockett song from the disney show fest parker right. and all that he'll just mm-hmm. be like uh he loves that song <laughs> but this is um i'm pretty close to uh by where davy crockett is uh i don't know if uh because it's um what is it called uh what's the place called not maryville i don't is maryville tennessee or is it uh yeah it's pronounced maryville but yes yeah, that's right. I'm I'm close by there. I'm close by there. Yeah, no, I've I'm been there many times. Louisiana, but yeah, they yeah, have been, the museum there. So no, should, we probably cross paths and stuff. You because I'm I'm in, I don't I'm not gonna I don't want to reveal yeah. where I'm at and stuff. But I'm at I'm yeah. at a very well, I grew up near place. Shelbyville, Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. I grew up near Shelbyville, Tennessee. So yeah, mm-hmm. so we we'd go over in that part of Knoxville and then of course Maryville and all that quite a bit. So actually, my okay. sister married a guy who grew up in Maryville. So this is such a and small world. That's crazy. Well, Smith and Wesson's moving down there. Whoever they That's are. That's what I heard. <laughs> That's what I heard. I was trying. To, I was already looking online for applications, seeing if they'd hire if they're hiring already, but I haven't noticed. But <laughs> right. That'd be that'd be yeah, an awesome. Yeah, it's a small little town. So yeah, it would definitely help. But that, it's a good place to put in a factory for sure. Yeah, that'll help the economy. <laughs> you know, it I sucks. Say, I gotta say, I'm a little jealous that you grew up kind of in that area because, you know, we got a river bottom, but it's polluted. Um, you're you're in this place where you can go wander around the creeks, have fires. We haven't been able to have a fire camping for like o- over a year because of all of our wildfires here in California. And uh, uh, you sorry, gotta hike like yeah, we we've been having so much rain. I mean, it it rained for almost the last day and a half here. So everything's, you know, green and everything's flowing. And yeah, it's definitely a different environment. So I've been out West quite a bit. Matter of fact, I spoke at the uh, Rubber Tramp Rendezvous last, last January. Uh, and that there's, a, it's actually on my YouTube channel uh, where I spoke out there. And then I'd also do, I called the Arizona Desert Adventure. So uh, I had, had, a, had a great time, flew out there. And uh, it's, it's people that live like the modern hobo lifestyle. They call them rubber tramps. So they don't, they don't ride trains anymore, but they have cars and RVs and, you know, vans and old buses. And, and there was like 20,000 of them that gathered around Quartzsite, Arizona last year. And they invited me to come out and be one of the main stage speakers. So that was a real privilege. I enjoyed that. And you can watch They're that like, whole presentation. It's like a modern day gypsy where they got their uh, big step van or something like that. And, uh, yeah, but all the way down to people that are literally living out of their car and, and traveling all over the United States and, and. And happy as can be. I mean, they're, you know, they're free from a lot of the modern, you know, things that, that drag a lot of us down. So. Yeah. Once you, uh, once you stop paying rent, you suddenly don't have to spend all your time working. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, taxes drop way down too, because, you know, you don't, you don't pay property taxes. You're just, you know, keep tags on your car, pay your insurance and, you know, keep food in your stomach. And, you know, the, the, the only problem with that is, is you're very limited to what you can carry. And so they have to be very, very efficient at their lifestyle. So it's a really fascinating group, uh, just like the hobos. Uh, they're kind of the modern version of it. And they, uh, they really know how to make do with less. And I, like I had a comment on my channel here last day or two. Uh, somebody said, you know, man, why would you, why would you make a, a frying pan out of a, you know, a tin can? So I took a number 10 tin can. I call it the tin can fry pan. And I, I invented it, and I, I put it all together, and I show you how to burn out the plastic liner inside, and then then I fried some eggs in it, and, and it's almost nonstick. It's hilarious, you know, because it's just a just a bottom of a tin can. But uh, you know, like you should just go to to Walmart or go to a thrift store and just buy a pan. And someone answers said, "Have you ever not had twenty dollars? Like it really stinks, you know, when you don't have any money and you have to make your yeah. stuff." And what people don't realize is the hobos did have access us the tools they were working traveling men hobos were working men tramps were, were traveling dreamers uh and and bums were guys that just traveled and drank or a lot of times they didn't travel they just they just drank but you know hobos really did not want to be called tramps or bums they they had a real um, um they had a real sense of pride 
because it started right after the Civil War. Uh, a lot of guys from both sides, both Union and and from the South and Confederacy, they they didn't have jobs. Everything was destroyed, especially after Sherman did his march across the South. I mean, it was a you know huge swath, and so uh, of just destruction. And so these guys, you know, hit the rails and they went all over. And there's a lot of discussion about why they're called hobos. Uh, some guys said because it's because they carried hoes. They were hoe boys, and they would go and they would hoe you know row crops for farmers. Or someone said it's because uh, they would call out, you know, ho, bo, you know, B-E-A-U, uh, which was kind of the name for a, a guy back then. Or uh, homeward bound. You take the first uh, two letters of each word, and ho homeward bound is hobo. And, uh, of course, they traveled the rails to get home. So there, nobody really knows for sure where they came from, but they were proud. They even had their own union. So hobo union. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, they were real workers. You know, that, yes. that reminds me of uh, the Grapes of Wrath, where they uh, would travel and pick the crops. And right. they would go where the work was. And they they would uh, negotiate and sometimes mm -hmm. take very little for their labor. But uh, they always wanted to make a living of some kind. Most of the railroads, when they were laying rails across the United States, were built by, put in by hobos. And a lot of our big dam systems. Uh, that you know, they date back to the 20s and 30s, especially during the Depression, because uh, that's when the hobos. There at one point, there was almost a million people that they estimated were riding the rails like that. Oh, wow! So that's crazy. Yeah, a big project like a dam will put a lot of people to work. It did. It did. But of course, as soon as it was over, then you had to go and find more work somewhere else, because it was always you're always working yourself out of a job. Right. Yeah, to see it to completion. Right. I've always been fond of the hobo nickels. You know, yes, they, those are fa fascinating. Hobo nickel. I mean, all right. So you can still buy them on team. eBay, but you have to be careful because some of them okay. are knockoffs, and there actually are some guys though that are doing it to keep the art alive. Right. So you take a nail and you make a chisel out of the nail and harden it, and they'll carve the nickel. They'll take the face. Uh, is it Jefferson? I see a, a, yeah, yeah, an yeah. Indian guy right here, a Native American he head. Yeah, an Indian head on one side, a buffalo on the other. <laughs> okay. Right. And they carve all kinds of different images using the face and the buffalo, like a skeleton. Or they'll put a clown hat on the, the face. And so this, this was a form of income, too. You know, the hobo would take yeah. a nickel and turn it into something worth a dollar. Well, some sure. of these are pretty cool. I'm going to... I'm going to share the same image real quick with everybody. I think, I think the uh, the most expensive one just sold for a little over $22,000. <sighs> wow. That's a pretty good deal for a... Uh, that's not the page I wanted to show. But no, that, these, uh, there it is. Wait. Uh... And you know, that's a small tool they can carry with them and do it when they have some downtime. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. sort of catalogs their journey. Uh, yeah. And they also did it with the tip of a, of a pocket knife. A lot of them carried pocket knives. and Because you got to remember how small a nickel is. You imagine how good your eyesight would have to be. Um, you know, right. I don't know that any of them had magnifying lenses. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you got to get pretty small and detailed to carve something that fine into a nickel. Are these, like, things that they would do? Is this a accurate hobo nickel? Like Yes. Yeah. Oh, what? They would do all that from this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they would take the Indian and scrape it down and then re-carve it, re retool the back background and everything. They Even some of them, they would turn the uh, the buffalo into a mule. Those are pretty neat, too. Wow. Right, yeah. The, the, the front with the face is popular. This is a new one somebody did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I almost thought about it. I saw that guy speaking to Congress not too long ago. But... <laughs> Yeah, you talking no about kidding. the Futurama guy? <laughs> yeah. yeah there, there's Do some... hobos have any other uh, folk art besides this that comes to mind? Or is this the main venue? Well, you know, they, they were pretty inventive with their hobo symbols. Uh, they had their own language. Right. And, uh, yeah, someone just said Creative Redundancy has some awesome vids also. Uh, yeah, hey, Creative Redundancy. Uh, he's he's a cool guy. He was one of my very first subscribers when I first started, and uh, so, really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. what? Yeah, he's he's a cool kid. Lives up in crazy. Canada. So. Okay, but, uh, yeah, I see. Our is cool. That's insane. I, this is a small world. It keeps on coming together more and more. <laughs> right. 
So anyway, but yeah, they they not only had the their uh, you know their, that was its own language, but they also had uh, of course very descriptive words. For instance, if a lady brought you a your supper and you had to sit on the back porch eat it on your lap, it was called a, a knee shaker. Yeah, the lady of the house gave me a knee shaker. So that was a meal that you sat on your knees and ate on the back porch. But uh, anyway, so they also had, you know, a lot of uh, things that they would make, uh, you know, the hobo stoves. And they're, they're, you know, not, not every hobo used a hobo stove, you know, but there are there were definitely some that were made. And there were more, there was two reasons. First of all, it would, uh, it used less fuel. Uh, secondly, it would hide the light of the fire from, you know, from the bulls that would call the police that would, you know, the railroad police. And so that, that you couldn't see it. And so it not only used less fuel, but it concentrated the heat and, uh, made it less visible. So you could, you could cook your food, but so that's a type of art because they got really creative with what most people considered trash. So, and of course the, the, the world's. Uh, one and only Hobo me Museum is in Britt, Iowa. And yeah. that's where they have the annual Hobo Convention. The Midwest is a place where the hobos would kind of convene at and stuff. Like... Yeah. yeah, they started around, wow. right around the year, I don't know, it was 112 years ago or something like that. They started having it. They, they moved it from Chicago at the invitation of, of Britt, Iowa, because they, uh, they had a lot of people that used, uh, a lot of the local farmers used hobo labor to bring in the crops every year. And so they said, hey, let's just have the convention here. And they still fix massive pots of mulligan stew. And it's turned into more of a family affair, though, uh, than because a lot of your a lot of your old hobos, you know, they've uh, what do they say they've taken their last westbound train. And so, um, you know, they've gone off into the sunset. But uh, and, and of course, it's really rare to find someone that's known as a bridger. A bridger is someone who uh, used to ride both steam and then rode the diesel electric locomotives. And so they, they bridged both of those eras. Of course, nowadays it's just diesel electric. So most of those old timers are gone. Yeah, you'd have to be pretty old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, 1950s wow. is when the, you know, the diesel electrics came in, so. Yeah. They're easily in their 80s or 90s now at this point. Uh, oh, yeah. I, know some, yeah. I know some boys from up north, they used to do restoration on steam engines. Oh, uh, they cool. were old. Uh, machine uh, mill operators so they'd make mm -hmm. custom parts for the local uh, museum and whatnot yeah so. if you ever get to nashville make sure you go to centennial park they have an absolutely monstrous steam locomotive there it's well worth seeing yeah. i think it's a 484 yeah. something like that so four wheels in the front eight wheels in the middle those great big massive drive wheels and then four in the back so it has both a front and a rear truck yeah, it's it's a it's a neat looking, neat. I mean, it's just I forget how many hundreds of tons it weighs. You know, I, I used to go play on the railroad tracks as a kid, and, and just the hobo folklore always made me want to like get on a train and ride it somewhere. But you know, it's yeah. it's dangerous yeah. and it's not safe. But there's that mystique and allure. But I'm sure <laughs> that it was nothing like that. You know. It, for these people to eke out a living like this. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Actually, when COVID first hit our area back in March of last year, I filmed a, a whole video. Uh, again, it's, a, it's, it's not a talking one, but it's, uh, it's called Hobos in Hard Times. And uh, it, it's got me playing the part of a hobo. <laughs> so it's, I don't know, seven, eight, nine minutes long. I forget how long it is, but that was, that was a lot of fun. Went, there's some abandoned uh, railroad cars and an old abandoned train station. And it was it was a real nostalgic kind of thing for me to do. I've always been very fascinated with that culture. It sounds like you don't have any trouble thinking of ideas for videos, huh? <laughs> I, you know, it's funny, but I actually do. It's one of my greatest struggle to come up with new content every week. Uh, I have a very inventive mind and I'm always reading and, and researching. And, uh, but I, I really also, it's very important for me to put out valuable content. I want, and I want something that, uh, is what YouTubers call an evergreen video. And basically you can watch it now or you can watch it 10 years from now and it still has value. 
Uh, like if you do daily news broadcasts, I mean, unless somebody's researching history, they're very, you know, not very likely to get many views on that after the event is over. But if you put out videos on how to make a, a you know, a stove out of a tin can, <laughs> then like I said, 10 years from now, as long as we have tin cans in, in dumps and, you know, of course those big tin cans like that, you can find those almost every restaurant uh, uses those, you know, uh -huh. this is number 10. That's the first thing 10, I thought 10. whenever I saw that video, I was like, oh, I got a bunch of these on my job, dude. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was, people said, I don't know where I would get those. And I said, just, you know, go to a restaurant. They'll probably give it to you for free. Yeah. So we just throw them out. Right. Yeah. And it's a, it's an incredible source. As a matter of fact, there was a guy in the old West that collected a bunch of those tin cans. Cause we've had tinned foods since the mid 1800s. And what he did was he built a cabin and then he cut the top and bottom out of the cans, snipped them in half, folded them flat, and then nailed them on his roof like shingles and had a, had a free tin roof. Yeah. I seen that somewhere. Yeah. He roofed the cabin. Yeah. So really, really cool. And that's the kind of resourcefulness that, you know, people need to have because uh, these resources are all around us. You know, people are building homes with old tires and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you got to think outside of Home Depot a little bit, you know. Well, especially with the price of lumber and everything, yeah. you know, it's, it's really forced people to be more frugal. I think it went up 400 percent and it's come down a little bit, but... Uh, sure. Yeah, it's it's we're going to have to go back to what our ancestors knew and how they lived. And that was, you know, it was a very frugal lifestyle. Uh, and, and they when my grandparents passed, they they were both my grandpa was born in 1909. And I think my grandma was born in 1913. And so they both were well of age through the 1930s. And of course, people don't realize, but the Great Depression really didn't end until World War Two. And finally, the war economy put everybody back in factories, sent most of the young men overseas. And then that left a lot of job openings back home. And so that's when we started to get more full employment and things started to look up. So really from 1929 up into at least the middle toward the end of the 19, mid 1940s. So it was a good 13, 14 year period where it was really hard. And when they passed, I mean, there, there was all kinds of stuff. They, they weren't hoarders, they were savers they would save like bits of string and you, you tie it together. You make a ball of string. It might be different sizes, but it was a ball of useful twine and cordage you could tie things with. Or uh, my grandma had a stack of, of uh, styrofoam egg cartons um, because again, you can use it for all sorts of things. Uh, you know, you can use, even today, you can use the cardboard cartons. People pour a mix of sawdust and paraffin with a wick in it and each little egg becomes a fire starter. So... Right, yeah, and people were making soap, and, you know, people were making their own alcohol because it was just cheaper. Yeah. You, know, you just didn't have money to blow on stuff like that. Right, and uh, my grandpa said when they were, they lived up in Michigan at the time, and they needed tires for the car and couldn't get rubber uh, because of the war effort and because everything that was right. going on was really hard to get a hold of. And so they took great big, uh, of course, they're not far from the Great Lakes, so they had, they had really big ropes, we called a ship hosser. Mm -hmm. And they tied those around the uh, Model T uh, to loop yeah. it around and drive on the drive on the rope. Wow. And then, of course, it wore out pretty quick. and You'd have to stop and put some more on. <laughs> hmm. My yeah. favorite example of the frugalness is the flower uh, sack dresses. You know, the grain and stuff would come in a big bag and then the old ladies would sew dresses and they'd have the logo on their chest, you know. I don't know. Yeah, I've never worn one of those, but it sounds rough. Yeah, I'm sure burlap is not comfortable. <laughs> right? You wouldn't find one of those in a museum either. You'd be really lucky because it would have been worn out, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's it's it's, it's kind of interesting stuff like that you won't survive as an example. Well, and with something like that, even if it got ripped or or torn, uh you could be sure that uh, people would would cut it into pieces and then stitch it into small bags and you know various other things so things many things were repurposed um in my in my uh, late 18th century series i searched and searched and searched to try and find an 18th century shovel um you can't find any unless you know in a museum once in a while uh, i did eventually find a blacksmith that made one for me 
but uh, you, what you end up realizing is they, they wore them out. I mean, it's a shovel. So, you know, from, you know, the late 18th century on into the 19th century, if it was on a farm, you, you kept using it until it was no good for anything. And then you would take it to the blacksmith and they would take that metal and they would hammer and forge it into something else that was useful. So there's almost no, no uh, examples. And of course they started making shovels uh, for the continental army in the 1770s. Uh, George Washington put in a large order for shovels, so there was thousands of them made. Um, so, they were just ground down to a nub, basically. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, so you, you can find old examples, but it's it, most of what you find are like versions of ones that have been uh, remade. So, And a lot of shovels back then were actually carved out of wood, and they put a, what they call an iron toe on it. Uh, they bend a piece of metal over the tip because they didn't dig with shovels like we do. They would they would root out the ground with picks and mattocks and loosen up the soil. And so a shovel was only for shoveling. It was not for digging. Okay, for moving material, yeah. Right, and, and because even the shovels they had were made of iron, not steel, so they were soft. So if you tried to pick up too much weight with it, it would just bend. Mm. I wonder what yeah. To make the, I wonder what, what caused that... Uh, that change in the way that it's used well uh you know probably part of it and we know like i said in the 1770s uh when george washington ordered a bunch of them uh you know trench warfare uh they you know instead of just marching up in front of uh, you know and, and, and mowing each other down even though they did that to some extent uh they started to dig breastworks uh, they started to, you know, uh, build and dig forts and all that sort of thing. So emplacements. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a change in, in strategies. So. Yeah, war drives a lot of industrial engines. Mm -hmm. It does. Cool advancements, huh? Wow. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else want to get in? from the uh, the chat room and say hey while we're still talking Any questions I am um, actually might have to the wife is about to be here soon I you guys know how that is so I might have <laughs> yeah I might have to um wrap it up if if, if you guys got anything else you guys got anything you want to plug in or anything like that um, well, I, I, well just, I will I do have one thing I want to add real quick um, I am going to be editing uh, all eight episodes together. Uh, and I'll be selling that on my website, uh, for like twenty four ninety five, And so it'll be like season one. And so you'll be able to buy that. It, it, it helps me support, uh, filming the rest of it. There's still a lot of things I have to buy and do and travel. And so it's been a really expensive eight episodes so far. And so hopefully by selling those DVDs, that'll help me, uh, you know, push on to the next, next episode. So uh, that should be out in the next month. Now, do you have a Patreon or anything like that where people can kind of just... Yes, I do. Yeah, and I appreciate all the support I get. It, Like I said, it really does help me a lot. Yeah, if enough people just give you a dollar a month, it'll uh, it'll empower you to make more content. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's... And, and that's, that's huge to me. I mean, I really appreciate my Patreons. I mean, appreciate everybody that watches, you know, because, uh, you know, they you got the commercials and all that kind of stuff. And of course that's how YouTubers get paid. So it's, it's part of that. But um, yeah, the, the big thing is, you know, when you can get people to really start believing in the work you're doing and want to be a part of it and uh, you know, help get those episodes out. So it's really important. Great. So everyone who's watching and listening, if you haven't already go subscribe to waypoint survival, check out the website, uh, give them all kinds of thumbs ups and leave them good comments. Let's push them further down that algorithm. Yeah, much appreciated. So, thanks for coming on the show, man, and thanks for your like very friendly outlook. You know, you replied immediately on the comments. You got back to us on Instagram. That's pretty right on, man. Well, I appreciate it. I really do try to answer everybody. Um, unfortunately, as the channel grows, I don't know that I'll be able to keep that up. I, I often spend you know, an hour or two at a time, just typing answers uh, and trying to respond to people uh, in a kindly, thoughtful way, but also in an educational way, because sometimes people ask questions and I can pretty clearly see they don't understand the context of the video. 
or why I'm teaching a certain aspect of whether it's a hobo lifestyle or the 1790s. There's a lot of things that people don't understand. So I really try to take time and, and educate. But uh, yeah, so as, as much as I can, I did actually get behind when I got those millions of views in those 100 days. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I actually, there's some of those comments I, I still haven't answered because I just got overwhelmed. I think I got a hundred and the, the highest I got was like 150,000 views in one day. Wow. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was overwhelming. <laughs> you got buried basically. <laughs> I did. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, hopefully this little interview will help people understand the context of your, your approach, you know, what you're looking to do. And I hope you see some people reach out to you for your classes because that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, you guys both need to come. Yeah, so. I'm definitely, I'm not too far from you. And uh, I'm sure Roman would be down too. You get Foxhole to come down there. Foxhole, you'd be down for that trip? Yeah, I just got to, you know, plan a little vacation to do it. But uh, yeah, it'd be great. I would like to do it in the more, whenever the weather is the more harsh, I think would be better to really put myself to the, uh, <laughs> like when it's more cold and nasty outside. Well, so here's, here's the invitation. So after you take my phase one class, then all of my phase one and up students are invited to go on a winter survival camping trip with me in February. We go to the Daniel Boone National Forest in Kentucky and we pray that rains or snows or sleets and it's just as miserable for us because we want to be challenged. <laughs> And uh, it's, at this point, it's only $25 a student to go with me. And so we, uh, we had a eight or nine guys this last uh, February. We had an absolute blast. Everybody's trying out their gear. Uh, we had snow and we had cold weather and ice. And yeah, it was just, it was, I actually love winter camping uh, because it's when you find out if, you're, if your stuff's any good, both your skills and your, your gear. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, I went primitive this time as well. I uh, took a backpack that I made out of a deer skin, and I, I bent the... Actually, I built it. You can see my, my gear loadout. It's called primitive gear loadout. And uh, I wore mucklucks and, uh, instead of boots and uh, slept on uh, a hide, a fur hide, on a pile of, uh, of branches of boughs, green boughs that I made under a canvas tarp. So... Wow. Well, that must have been fun. Yeah, yeah, we had a great time. So you guys take the phase one class. You can come with me on a winter trip. All right. That's a nice invitation. Straight I'll up, have to yeah, put in my vacation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I should have all the classes up for the new year in December. So at this point, I'm still wrapping up. i got a phase one this month. i got a phase two class next month. I have any classes in December. And then we start again in February with the winter survival camping trip. And then normally my classes start again in April. So okay. in springtime. Yeah, a little spring, you, you build your schedule. That's great. Okay. Right. So I'll post that stuff normally on my website. Do what? So I'm definitely I'm definitely trying to get into this phase one as soon as possible. I'm going to get together a foxhole and talk more about this, get together with some of the other dudes in the in this thing. And so we see what's up with them. And that'd be awesome. I could, I could imagine like all the this part of the YouTube, like all of like, you know, like Hutch, me, Foxhole, yeah. Pero James, we're like, ah, oh, really like making a little dude. That'd be awesome. Man. <laughs> it'd be a little reunion. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be a lot of fun. I look forward to it. So. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for all your time, James. And uh, yes, you're you welcome. So Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Keep your powder dry. Absolutely. Yeah. Guys, God bless you guys. Thank you for watching the show. Um, this was a good one. There'll be many more like this in the future.